Good day. So in this session, I am to talk about medical parasitology. So we will learn some basic definitions and concepts when we deal with parasites. So for our learning objectives, at the end of this lesson, you're all expected to identify and categorize various biological relationships, host vectors, and sources of infection. You have to evaluate the modes of transmission of parasites in the determination of successful infection and lastly, determine the effects of host-parasite relationships and immunological events that may play a role in the infection process. So primarily, these are the concepts that we are to discuss and we are to learn in terms of medical parasitology. But before that, let me just give an emphasis in the difference between parasitology and medical parasitology because I indicated here medical parasitology. So, when we say parasitology, that means generally we are concerned with the phenomenon of dependence of one living organism on another organism. So, that's basically parasitology. But when we say medical parasitology, this is concerned primarily with the animal parasites of humans. So, that means those parasites infecting human individuals and of course their medical significance as well as their importance in human communities. So in this topic, we are to learn the morphology, life cycle, diagnosis, treatment, transmission, prevention, and of course connecting them is the pathogenesis of the diseases. So when we say pathogenesis, that simply means the manner of development of diseases. So in this case, we will be talking parasitic diseases. Now let us talk about biological relationships. So the term symbiosis, this is very common to us and that means the living together of unlike organisms. And this was first coined by a German, his De Bari, in 1879 to mean living together again of unlike organisms. And there are four general types of symbiotic associations, phoresis, commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism. So let's take first phoresis or phoresy. So in this case, um, the simple definition of phoresis is to carry. So that means to transport or to bring a smaller organism the larger organism is carrying a smaller organism. So that's the basic definition of phoresis or phoresy. So in short, this is a type of symbiotic relationship in which one organism, the smaller one, we call it the phoron, is mechanically carried on or in another species. So we call the bigger one as the host and that smaller phoron is carried for just a limited period of time. But take note also that in addition to transport or carrying of this smaller foron, the host may incidentally provide shelter or even some indirect defense or protection for the foron. But take note that the strict definition of foresy excludes any direct physiological benefit during transport or transit. So in short, foresis means to carry. So like for example, if the host does not provide the foreron with food while in transit or it does not contribute to the development of the foreron during transit, then it would mean phoresis or phoresy. However, take note of this one, if feeding does occur, so if the host is feeding the foreron, so the more appropriate term to describe this relationship would be parasitism. But take note again, Although phoresy is not a form of parasitism, phoresy can eventually extend into a parasitic association. So, in this topic or in this session, let us just define phoresy as a process in which a bigger thing, the host, is carrying a smaller organism, the foron, and neither organism is physiologically dependent on the other. Next one, we have commensalism. So commensalism, it means eating at the same table. And it's a symbiotic relationship in which two species, okay, two species live together and one species benefit 
from the relationship without harming or benefiting the other. So in short, one species benefit and the other is neither hurt nor helped. So in short, one species is taking the advantage but despite of it taking, taking advantage from another organism, this another organism is not hurt or it is not helped. And one of the examples is a female pea crab in the mantle cavity of its muscle host. So in this case, the crab does not damage the muscle and uses its shell. So it uses the shell of the muscle solely for protection. So you have to take note that in commensalism, both partners are able to lead independent life, just like in forestry. But in this case, one may gain advantage from the association when they are together and at least not damage the other. And aside from that one, this kind of relationship occurs when one member of the associate, associating pair, usually the smaller, receives all the benefit and the other member is neither benefited nor harmed. So in medical parasitology, one of the best example of this would be the intamoeba coli. So, um, the intamoeba coli, um, it lives in our intestinal lumen. So, the host, we human individuals, supply that intamoeba coli with the nourishment and um, we protect that intamoeba coli from harm. And normally, this parasite does not cause any damage to the tissues of human host unless we are immunocompromised or we have some existing illnesses or diseases. Next, we have mutualism. So by the name itself, this means two organisms mutually benefit from each other. So take note, both species benefit. So in commensalism, only one species benefit. So in this case, it's mutualism. So one of the examples is the termites and the flagellates in their digestive system, which synthesizes cellulose to aid in the breakdown of ingested wood. So this means the reason why the termites can digest the wood is because of the flagellates living in its intestine. So that's mutualism. So the termites are being helped by the flagellate in order to get its food. On the other hand, the flagellate is also protected by the termite. So that is mutualism. So another example of this is that um, the honeybee bringing pollen to a desert shrub. So that's also mutualism. And last one, okay, so this is very important, parasitism. So this will be the main point of the entire discussion. So parasitus, that comes from the word para means beside and situs meaning grain of food. So, it is a symbiotic relationship where one organism, so the parasite, lives in or on another depending on the latter for its survival and usually at the expense of the host. So, this means the parasite benefits and the host is being harmed. So, this means that parasitism is a relationship in which one organism the host is the source of food and shelter for another organism, the parasite. And in this type of relationship, all the benefits go to the parasite and the host is harmed by the relationship. So one example of this and one of um, the pathogenic amoeba is the intamoeba histolytica. So this is a pathogenic amoeba. So by learning about the biological relationships, particularly the parasitism, we have now here the definition of a parasite. So this is based from Webster's Third New International Dictionary. So a parasite is an organism living in or on another living organism. So that means this parasite could be found outside the host or inside of the host and obtaining from it part or all of its organic nutriment commonly exhibiting some degree of adaptive structural modification and causing some degree of real damage to the host. So that means this parasite is living 
in a host. So that means it benefits from the host and as well as damages or harms the host. Next one. So for the classification of the parasite, so we have endoparasite, ectoparasite, obligate facultative, accidental or incidental, permanent, temporary, and spurious parasite. So for the ecto and endoparasite, so the main difference of this one is in the location of the parasite. So when we say ectoparasite, it is a parasite living outside of the body of the host. Whereas when we say endoparasite, that means a parasite living inside of the body of a host. So in this example, we can see here, in this case, the mosquito is an ectoparasite, whereas this one is a nematode living inside the intestine. So that is an endoparasite. So we could also say that when we say infection, we are dealing with the presence of endoparasite. So let me write it here, infection. Whereas when we say infestation, we are dealing with the presence of an ectoparasite. So infestation. How about this term? Erratic. So when we say erratic, that means when a parasite is found in an organ which is not its usual habitat. Like for example, the Ascaris, the habitat of Ascaris lumbricoides is inside of our small intestine. However, most of the time, or in some um, chronic ascariasis, the ascaris could be found in our lungs, um, in our liver, for example. So that means ascaris is an erratic parasite because we can find um, that parasite in an organ which is not its usual habitat. Next one, obligate parasite. So this means they need a host at some stage of their life cycle to complete their development and to propagate their species. So that means when you say obligate parasite, it depends entirely upon their host for existence. So just like in the illustration, so obligate parasites, examples of that are lice and also mites. Next one, we have facultative parasites. So they may exist in a free living state. Take note of that one. They could be free living or they could be parasitic. So that means a facultative parasite can exist in the environment, can get its nutrition, can get its food without harming another organism. But if there is an instance, it could become parasitic and could depend on another organism in order to survive. So facultative. Next one, accidental or incidental parasite. So that means it establishes itself in a host where it does not ordinarily live. So that means um, this parasite um, is living in a host wherein it is not its normal habitat. So example of accidental or incidental parasite is Balantidium coli. So the natural host of Balantidium coli is the pig, but Usually, um, it could infect also human. Next one, permanent parasite. So permanent parasite, it remains on or in the body of the host for its en entire lifetime. Next, temporary parasite. So temporary parasite, as opposed to permanent parasite, lives on the host for only a short period of time. And also, we have spurious parasite, a free living organism. So free living that passes through the digestive tract without infecting the host. So examples of spurious parasites in animals, we have capillaria, capillaria, and also we have dipylidium caninum. So to sum it up, we have here the different types of parasites. So generally, we classify them as protozoans, Helminths and arthropods. For arthropods, they are considered as ectoparasites, like bugs, uh, mosquitoes, or even flies. So they are ectoparasites. For 
endoparasites, we have the protozoans and helminths. And particularly for the helminths, we have three general classifications. The nematodes, the trematodes, or these are the flukes. And we have the cestodes. These are the tapeworms. Now, let us have the hosts and types of hosts. So, by definition, a host is an organism that harbors or carries the parasite. And we have two general classifications of host, the intermediate host and the definitive host or the final host. So, um, in order to differentiate them, you just have to take note that an intermediate host carries the asexual or larval stage of the parasite, whereas the definitive host carries the sexual or the adult stage of the parasite. So example, in tenia infection. So in tenia parasite, we could have um, tenia solium or tenia saginata. So the larval stage of tenia species are usually found in cattle, in cows, or in pigs. So for tenia solium particularly, the intermediate host is a pig, whereas in Tinea saginata, the intermediate host is a cattle, particularly a cow. So, talking about this one, I said that both of them are intermediate hosts. So, that means the pig and the cattle are types of intermediate host because they carry the larval stage of Tinea solium and Tinea saginata respectively. So, in Taniasis, the definitive host is the human individuals. So, that means we humans carry the adult stage of the parasite. Another thing, um, definitive host, for example, in mal malaria. So, in malaria, we have the parasite plasmodium. So, in malaria, the adult stage of the parasite is being carried by the mosquito and the larval stage of the parasite is carried by humans. So in Plasmodium, the definitive host is the mosquito, whereas the intermediate host is the human. So that's how we differentiate intermediate host and um, definitive host. So another type of host is a paratonic host. So this is one in which the parasite does not develop further to later stages. However, the parasite remains alive and is able to infect another susceptible host. So the other name for this paratonic host is a transport host or a carrier host. So that means the parasite no longer develop. So in other, um, in other words, the parasite no longer matures in a paratonic host. But take note that this paratonic host can pass on um, the parasite to another host. So, example of this paratonic host is a wild boar. So, in Paragonimus westermani, so Paragonimus westermani. So, it has a stage known as Metasarcaria. So, this Metasarcaria in a raw wild boar meat can pass through the intestinal walls of humans and complete its development. So, in this case, what is now the paratonic host of the metasarcaria of Paragonimus westermani. So in this case, the wild boar serves as the paratonic host of the metasarcaria because in wild boar, the, meta, uh, the metasarcaria no longer matures into another stage and it is passed on to humans still as a metasarcaria and it is where it will develop into um, another stage or will complete its development. Next one, we have the reserva host. So this is um, an organism harboring the same species of parasite as man and they are potential sources of human infections. So like for example, in Balantidium coli. So in Balantidium coli, the reserva host is a pig. In um, Brugia malayi, for example, Brugia malayi, the reserva host are the cats. And this Paragonimus westermani, the rats are considered as reserva host. Again, what is the paratonic host in Paragonimus westermani? So it is a wild boar. Now let us have the vectors. So vectors are responsible for transmitting the parasite 
from one host to another. So normally, there are mosquitoes or other arthropods. And we have here two classifications of vectors, the biologic or the mechanical vector. So for biologic vectors, they transmit the parasite only after the latter has completed its development within the host. So that means the biological vectors are the ones supporting the development of the parasite. So example of this is the Aedes mosquito. So find uh, we can find in Filariasis. So this one in Filariasis, the Aedes mosquito um, can support the development of filarial parasite from first larval stage to third larval stages. So in short, these are biological vectors because they support the development of the parasite. Next one, how about mechanical or phoretic vectors? Remember this one, phoretic. So that means to carry or to transport. So in short, they only transport the parasite. So mechanical vectors, examples of that are fa um, flies, um, cockroaches, which feed on fecal materials and transfer it to food and would eventually be eaten by humans. So those are the differences between biologic and mechanical vectors. Next one, exposure and infection. So we have several terms here, carrier, exposure, and um, infection. So when we say carrier, they harbor a particular pathogen without manifesting any signs and symptoms. So that means they are hosts that carry the parasite, but they are not exhibiting signs and symptoms of disease. And what is the disadvantage of being a carrier is that you might pass on the infection to another individual without knowing it because in the first place, you don't show signs of infection. But in you, you have the pathogen or the parasite. How about for this one? Exposure and infection. So for exposure, the process of inoculating an infective agent. So that means when we say exposure, the pathogen has already entered um, a human person or a host. But it doesn't mean that when the pathogen enters the human host, it could eventually cause infection. It's still dependent on the immune system of the host. So that means exposure, the pathogen or the parasite has already um, um, entered the host. How about this one? Infection. It connotes the establishment of the infective agent in the host. So this means that the parasite or the pathogen has already invaded the immune system of the host, meaning to say it has already established itself in a host, causing now a disease process. How about this one? Incubation period and pre-patent period. For incubation period, it is a period between infection and the evidence of infection. So that means it is a time between infection and the first appearance of signs or symptoms. So that is incubation period. For pre-patent period, it's the period between infection and the demonstration of infection. So in short, it is the time interval between the date of infection and the detection of the parasites in our specimen. So if the parasite is not yet detected in our specimen, but the patient it is showing signs and symptoms, that means that person is still in an incubation period. But if a person is already infected and has already parasites detected in the clinical specimens, then that patient in, is in its pre-patent period. How about this one? Auto-infection and super-infection. For auto-infection, this results when an infected individual becomes his, um, his own direct source of infection, meaning to say you are infecting yourself. And one of the classic examples of this is the Enterobius vermicularis. So a person infected with Enterobius vermicularis can infect himself by inhaling or ingesting eggs of this parasite, usually whenever the person is asleep. Next one, super infection. So happens when the already infected individual is further infected with the same species, leading to massive infection within the parasite. Take note, there is massive infection. So there is a large increase in worm burden. So that is super infection. So one of 
Um, the examples of this is um, the alteration in the normal life cycle of strongyloides stercoralis. So, strongyloides. So, this one, this is a nematode. So, um, it could infect humans and usually um, a human host could experience super infection whenever there is a large increase in worm burden which may also lead to severe debilitation or even death due to an increase um, in the proportion of the lar larva of strongyloides that transforms into another stage or another larval stage while present in the intestine of the human person. For the sources of infection, primarily we have contaminated soil and water as the most common sources of infection. So these are usually because of lack of sanitary toilets, use of night soil or human excretas or feces as fertilizers. So for soil, for contaminated soil, we could harbor ascaris, also hookworm, so hookworm, and also we could harbor tricuris, the whipworm. For contaminated water, particularly we have amoeba and also schistosoma. So those are the parasites that can be harbored um, as we come in contact with contaminated soil or water. Next one, contaminated food or raw or undercooked food. So like for example, in crabs, so we could get Paragonimus westermani. And as mentioned earlier, in pork and in beef. So the intermediate host of Tania solium is the pig. So we could harbor this Tania solium parasite through eating contaminated pork. So this one, Tania solium. For Tania saginata, we have the beef as the source of infection. Next one, arthropods. So, the classic example of this, again, is of course, malaria and filaria. So, the source of infection for that, the arthropod, um, for those parasites, are your mosquitoes. So, again, for malaria and filariasis or filarial parasite. Also, um, we could get toxoplasma gondii in cats. So, in cats, we have Toxoplasma gondii. Also, um, in Cheche fly. So, Cheche fly. So, in this vector, we could get African trypanosomiasis. So, trypanosomiasis. Also, kissing bugs. So, kissing bugs, on the other hand, American trypanosomiasis. So, those are just examples of arthropods and animals that could carry the parasite and will serve as sources of infections. Next one, we have the beddings or the clothings. So, we call them as fomites. So, fomites, they are inanimate objects that could be the sources of infection. So, our beddings, our pillows, even our doorknobs could serve as fomites. And um, example of um, the parasites that could be harbored through these fomites, through this inanimate object, um, is the inter, uh, Enterobius vermicularis. Next one, human. So humans can be direct sources of infection, particularly in Intamoeba histolytica, the food handlers who are um, infected with Intamoeba histolytica. So those are for the sources of infection. Next one, for the modes of transmission. Since the most common source of infection um, are contaminated soil and water, what is then the most common mode of transmission? It's through ingestion. It's through our mouth. Again, like in Taniasis, um, in, in Tamiba Histolytica, we could get the infection through ingesting contaminated water. Also, Again, skin penetration. So we could have hookworm, for example, and also schistosoma through water. So hookworm through soil and schistosoma through water. Both of them through skin penetration. Next one, vector bites. So in malaria and filariasis, again, we have congenital um, transmission 
we have again toxoplasma gondii. So this means it could be passed on um, from the mother to the fetus. Next one, transmammary transmission. So it's transmitted through the mother's milk. So we have the ansylostoma. So this one is a kind of hookworm. And also we have strongyloides. So they can be harbored or um, the mode of transmission for these parasites um, is through transmammary transmission. Of course, we have inhalation. Again, we have enterobius vermicularis. Next one, sexual intercourse, the most common of the uh, the most common um, parasite that can be transmitted through sexual intercourse is Trichomonas vaginalis. So those are for the modes of transmission. Now let us have the types of life cycle. So when we say life cycle, by definition, it's the whole process of the growth and the development of the parasites. And we have two types of life cycle, the direct and indirect life cycle. So indirect life cycle, there is only one host. So in short, there is only a definitive host. There is no intermediate host. For the indirect life cycle, meaning to say there are more than one host. So that means it has an intermediate host and a definitive or final host. So just like in this case. So this is um, a life cycle of Hymenolepis nena. So this is a dwarf tapeworm. So this Hymenolepis nena has a direct life cycle and an indirect life cycle. So it has a dual pathway. So just like in this one, in direct life cycle, this one, so direct life cycle, the host here, which is a rat or a human, so usually the host will ingest the embryonated egg. So that is the mode of transmission, ingestion of embryonated egg in which the host directly ingests this parasitic stage. For the indirect life cycle, this one, so the host does not directly ingest the egg. So there is just um, first the ingestion of this embryonated egg by an arthropod. And the human or the rat will accidentally ingest this arthropod. So that is an indirect life cycle. So in the indirect life cycle, um, the infected arthropod here, this is the intermediate host. And the definitive host here is a rat or a human. Now, let us have the terms related to the treatment of diseases. First, deworming. So, deworming is the use of drugs. In this case, anti drugs in an individual or whenever there are public health programs. So, in short, deworming is the treatment of individuals found to be positive for a particular parasite or positive for a particular infection or disease. Next one, cure rate. So it's the number usually expressed in percentage of previously positive subjects found to be egg negative on examination of stool or urine sample using a standard procedure at a set time after deworming. So in short, these are the percentage of individuals that have been cured after deworming. So meaning to say, um, the persons are positive for infection or the persons have parasitic diseases. Then they are treated, they are dewormed. And then next, after deworming, they are cured. So the percentage of the individuals that have been cured after deworming is what we call the cure rate. Next one, egg reduction rate is the percentage fall in egg counts after the deworming based on the examination of a stool or urine sample using a standard procedure at a set time after the treatment. So meaning to say egg reduction rate is a decrease in the worm burden after treatment or deworming. It does not necessarily mean that the patients have been treated or have been found to be negative for the parasite or infection. But this means that there is only a decrease in the number of the parasites in this individual who are treated. Next one, selective treatment, targeted treatment, and universal treatment. Selective treatment involves individual level deworming with selection for treatment based on a diagnosis of infection 
or an assessment of the intensity of infection or based on presumptive grounds. So that's for the selective treatment. So individual lev level. For targeted treatment, you have a criteria here. So this is a group level deworming where the risk groups um, to be treated uh, may be defined by age, sex, or other social characteristics. So in short, you have a criteria for the selection or for the treatment. Next one, universal treatment. So population level. So you treat everyone regardless of the criteria, regardless of age, sex, or other social characteristics or status of the patient. Next one, coverage. So this coverage refers to the proportion of the target population reached by an intervention. So meaning to say, those are the individuals which will be um, included in treatment or the worming. How about this one? Drug resistance is a genetically transmitted loss of susceptibility to a drug in worm population that was previously sensitive to the appropriate therapeutic dosage. So meaning to say, the, uh, the anti-helminthic drug or other drugs, for example, are previously effective to treat the infection. However, because of continued use or abuse of these drugs, these drugs now become ineffective to the infection, meaning to say the pathogen or the parasite has developed resistance to the drugs because of inappropriate use. Next one, efficacy. The effect of a drug against an infective agent in ideal experimental conditions and isolated from any context, whereas effectiveness is a measure of the effect of a drug against an in ineffective agent in a particular environment with specific ecological, immunological, and epidemiological determinants. So how do we differentiate efficacy and effectiveness? For example, there is a drug that might work very well as a painkiller. But then, this drug produces effects such as intense nausea, vomiting, or disturbances in the gastrointestinal functions of the human person. So, it, it has achieved its, um, its effect, it has achieved its purpose to be a painkiller. But because of the adverse reactions to the patients, then this drug is not effective. So it has no effectiveness because of these adverse effects, but it has efficacy because it has achieved its desired result. So in short, when we say efficacy, it's the capacity of a drug to achieve the desired result. In our example, it has achieved its desired result to be a painkiller or to relieve pain. Whereas effectiveness, it refers to how well the drug works and encompasses not only efficacy, but tolerability and ease of use. So in this case, in our example, the drug is not effective because it produces um, adverse reactions or adverse effects to the patient. So this one shows the summary of the classifications of the endoparasites that we are to discuss in the succeeding sessions. We have Nematoda, Cestoda, Digenia, Mastigophora, Sarcodina, Sporozoa, and Ciliata. That ends my discussion. Thank you so much.